part one, we dove into the Sunday Times at its latest piece targeting Meghan Markle, analyzing the dangerous implications of relentless media persecution. For over eight years, Meghan has been the subject of constant character assassination by the UK press, pushing narratives that uplift the monarchy at her expense. This isn't just biased reporting, it's a systematic lynching at her character. Now, here is part two. journalist about how the media inflames this. Uh, I was called by the Sun newspaper. If you don't know what the Sun is, it's sort it's of got the topless <laughs> girl on page three. That's all you need and to know. And they called me about a month ago to ask if I'd write about how Meghan was like Wallace and how Meghan was going to destroy the royal family and the arguments between Meghan and Kate. And I said, I'm really sorry. I'm just not privy to all of this. I don't think I could do it. And, and the commissioning editor uh, was really twisting my arm to write this article and say, but you could say, couldn't you, that X happened, and you could say that she's fired all her stuff, and you could say that Kate has said this. And I said, well, I'm really sorry. I don't know that. I can't do it. And this conversation went on for about half an hour, and I didn't write the article, but it just gives you an insight into how this whole thing is being, you know, the, the flames are being fanned by the media. Is you, my you've heard the phrase view. cottage industry. This is a palace industry. But my, yes. my, my day job, and I'm not... You know, having a delight talking to Storm and Wilfrey <laughs> is to cover the royal family. Yeah. As a former tabloid journalist, you know, I was told sometimes what to write, you know, by my right wing proprietors. Welcome back. Thank you for joining us for part two. We have learned thus far in the two clips that you just saw that the tabloid press, or perhaps the media in general in the United Kingdom, are willing to pay for you to write according to their narrative. So we know from these sources and also from others that have been offered money to write negative stories about Meghan Markle, the Duchess of Sussex. Another individual that shared his story about the way the tabloids do business is Simon Rex. Now, Simon of Rex was offered approximately about $70,000 in order to say he dated Megan, but not just say he dated her, but to imply that they had slept together. Now, when the actor was offered this amount of money, in his words, he says, I was broke as F. I really needed the money, but I'll be on food stamps before I do that. The actor also said that once Megan heard about this, she wrote him a letter to say thank you. You see, the tabloid press and media in general in the UK have been trying extremely hard for eight years or so to create this narrative and stereotype of the Black Duchess, the Black biracial Duchess. You see, she needs to fit in to the stereotype of how they see Black people, people of color, minorities. And they're finding it very hard, you see, for her to fit in to their narrative because every single stereotype that they've thrown at her, it bounces right back because that's not who she is. However, if you were to look at her hmm, father's side of the equation, they 
more easily fit into those stereotypes. But are they celebrated or are they? You can figure it out. Tom Sykes follows a well-known pattern often used by the Mordock media empire, capitalizing on selective narratives to fuel public disdain towards Meghan Markle. In this section, Tom Sykes focuses on Jason Knopf, the person responsible for the bullying allegations against Meghan. Allegations that remain unproven, by the way, to this date. Conveniently, Sykes neglects key elements that would complicate, I guess, his narrative and reveal its deeply biased underpinnings. Sykes described Na as a well credited communication professional who found his way into the royal household. What he fails to mention is that Jason Knopf wasn't neutral at all. He was an employee of Prince William and Kate, not Meghan. This barrage of negative articles about the breakdown of the relationship with her father was the final straw in a campaign of negative, nasty coverage about her. Looking back, it was one of the first acts um, of them breaking away from the institution. Harry and Meghan Markle are suing the Mail on Sunday. The lawsuit claims the Mail violated the law by publishing a personal letter she wrote to her father. This is a mass disclosure. I'm deciding the case now. I'm calling in it. Meghan's favor. Then uh, Associated predictably appealed. It was all, we thought, just an opportunity to generate more clickbait. When all of this started, I had no children. And now I have birthed two and lost one, and it's still going. When we were just about to go to the Court of Appeal, a senior member of the Duke of Cambridge's team came forward to give this witness statement, which wasn't... Fired. And sadly, there's just no way he could have done that without um, the authority of his bosses. Mail on Sunday was arguing all the way through this that actually this letter wasn't private because she shared a draft with her former press secretary and she shared text messages with him. Even during the course of those text messages, Meghan said, obviously everything I have drafted is with the understanding that it, it could leak. Jason Knopf accusations conveniently surfaced at a time when Meghan and Harry were facing increasingly media hostility and institutional pressure. Rather than address the critical question of why would Jason Knopf, a man who worked directly with Prince William, would bring these kind of allegations forth? Oh gosh, no. Tom Sykes instead frames Megan as the tyrant. Isn't it kind of tiresome, lazy journalism, I guess. Let's just, you know, paint the black biracial duchess, princess, as the tyrant, because we already have a built-in community that will buy this and already thinks that she is a tyrant. How do you deal with that? But so how do we deal with that? Like, how on earth, like... He works for his mother, like, I... I that, know. I know. I, that, like, I, I'm, it's your brother. I'm not going to say anything about your brother, but it's so obvious. It's like, what's he all? It is deeply suspicious, I would say, that Jason Knopf, that his actions, including providing evidence against Megan in her lawsuit against the Mail on Sunday, were unsolicited by the legal team. This move led Megan's lawyer to question whether Jason Knopf was acting at the direction of Prince William. Considering the timing and lack of any legal necessity for his involvement, yet 
Sykes remains silent. Page mea culpa from a UK tabloid over the weekend. The statement from Mail on Sunday stopped short of an apology, but it did acknowledge Markle's legal victory. The witness statement had no legal significance on the case whatsoever. And to actually vindicate a lot of what Meghan had been saying about how the letter was never intended to be published, but it was filed because the impact on Meghan's reputation was potentially damaging. The reporting skewered things to make it look falsely as if Meghan had lied, which she absolutely hadn't. Doesn't mention this matter at all. Preferring to promote the image of Meghan as a boss unfit for her role in the royal household. After these actions, Jason Knopf, guess what, was rewarded. By whom? Come on, I think you know the answer to that. With a promotion and continued his close work with Prince William. He eventually becoming the trustee for the Earthshot Prize. This too goes unmentioned by Sykes, who conveniently sidesteps the web of interconnected power dynamics at play, where Jason Knopf's loyalty to William overshadows any impartiality he may have had. And the piece of resistance is that it doesn't end there because Jason Knopf was also rewarded by William with the was made a lieutenant of the Royal Victorian Order. Isn't that great? Interesting. Greetings, my esteemed viewers. I trust you're mildly entertained by today's episode of Majesty Sussex Report. I mean, it's not quite tea with the Queen, not that Queen, the other Queen. Thank you, but one does what one can, doesn't one? Now, before you get too comfortable, might I remind you to bestow a like upon this humble video? Oh, and subscribing, well, it's terribly fashionable, you know. All the royals are doing it, or so I've heard in the servant halls. And as for that notification bell, well, ring it if you must. It ensures you don't miss our thrilling gossip about the Duke and Duchess of somewhere or another. I do love a good scandal. I mean, <laughs> thoughtful discussion. So go on, engage with the channel, dear. It keeps the gossip flowing. And frankly, who doesn't love a bit of drama? And with that, I bid you farewell, for now. Carry on and do be sure to come back, won't you? Tom Sykes' neglect also extends to Simon Case, described by Prince Harry in his memoir Spare as the Fly, a figure close to William and skilled in palace intrigue. Sykes omits that Case was central in stoking tensions between Harry and William, exacerbating their estrangement. His role in leaking negative stories to the press about Harry and Meghan in an effort to bolster William and Kate's public image cannot be overlooked. 
One notorious example was the private jet scandal in which Harry and Meghan were criticized for using Elton John's private jet. In contrast, William and Kate were conveniently photographed boarding a budget airline, a stage event that ultimately backfired, revealing that their supposed eco-friendly choice involved empty, em empty planes flown for the press optics. Simon Case left the palace to go work in the government of Boris Johnson. He has become a figure that is embroiled in controversy after controversy. He continued to demonstrate an ability to manipulate narratives for his own convenience and his employer's benefit. His work in the monarchy which included leaking stories harmful to Meghan and Harry, is directly tied to his proximity to William. Yet, like Jason Knopf, Skype fails to include these important details, further insulating Prince William from any culpability in the ongoing campaign against his brother and sister-in-law. I believe that details are important when you are reporting on any given story. Now, Tom Sykes writes the following. In a perfectly judged bit of theater, Harry walked on stage at the prestigious Clinton Global Initiative gathering in New York, dug his phone out of his pocket and said, my lock screen is a picture of my kids. What's yours? Now, I recall watching that entire presentation and speech of the Duke of Sussex, and I don't quite remember it the way Tom does. And you see, I'm a stickler for details, and if you're going to tell a story, tell it right. So let's check the tape. Please welcome Prince Harry, the Duke of Sussex. Good morning, everybody. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, in 1957. Now, this is what I saw and what I heard. This was an introduction that Prince Harry, when he opened, he opened with reference to monumental human achievements in space exploration, starting with the Soviet Union launch of Sputnik in 1957. Then he goes on to talk about the human journey into space in 1961 followed by American astronauts landing on the moon in 1969. These milestones illustrate humanity's ability to surpass limitations and achieve the unimaginable. He continues to say, however, while celebrating these global achievements, Harry pivots to a different challenge, the dangers of the online world particularly its impact on young people. 
The speech transitions from highlighting human progress in space exploration to a warning about the pervasive threats that the digital world presents today. Specifically, he addresses how the online space, while holding great potential, has become a source of anxiety, depression, social isolation, and disinformation, especially affecting young people. The theme of the speech shifts from celebration of innovation to a call to action for creating a safer and more nurturing digital environment. Now, I understand the temptation for dramatics. Trust me, I understand it. And trust me, I do understand that you're not going to write everything I just said as an intro. However, when you deceive the reader, that's a problem. Because you see, Harry did not just walk on stage, grab his phone, and then ask the question that he asked. That did not happen. As a matter of fact, I timed it to see how long from the minute he got on stage that he would actually take his phone out. Three minutes, right around three minutes or so. That is when he takes his phone out and he asks the, the, the audience the question. Now, why is that so difficult to just tell the truth? I understand you're trying to fit this idea, this concept, this vision of who Harry is, who Megan is, and your public to buy into that narrative. Just disclose it. Just say, part of what I say here is a fantasy created from my imagination to fit into my narrative. That's all. Because if you can't tell the truth, then do not call yourself a journalist. Do not call this a truthful piece. And this is so typical of these journalists in the UK. Megan, in an instant, may reach out to hold Harry's hands, and they interpret that as, look how bossy she is. She demanded to have his hands touched her hands. What kind of crock pot you people are drinking, eating, sleeping on? I, I, I don't understand what they're teaching you in journalism school. Because this thing that you're doing, that you're exercising, is certainly not journalism, my friends. Tom Sykes' article fits neatly into the larger agenda of the Murdoch media empire, which owns the Times. The Murdoch press has long profited from sowing division within the royal family, particularly by pitting Meghan and Harry against William and Kate. The article plays into a tired narrative, one that seeks to vilify Meghan at every turn while absolving William and the monarchy of any wrongdoing. The timing of Sykes' hit piece, given Meghan's success and Harry's solo engagements, reeks of an attempt to reunite negative coverage around the Duchess. The Murdoch Empire has always known how to weaponize public sentiment, especially in the UK, where the monarchy is deeply revered and any challenge to its pristine image is met with swift, harsh backlash. Now, here is a curious thing, because Sykes' mandate is not only to classify or to prop up this, these allegations of Megan being a bully and this difficult person to be with or around, this demanding person, but also to show that she is not an asset at all to Prince Harry. So what he does, perhaps he thinks it's very clever, is that he uplifts Prince Harry. 
He talks about him being on this solo trip to New York, all the important appointments and the incredible speech that he delivered. And then he comes in for Megan and he goes, you know, it's amazing that he's done, and I'm paraphrasing here, Harry has done these great things. He's got the recognition. He's on the global stage. And here comes this whole thing about Megan and her bullion. And a bunch of her workers now have put this, this, this piece in this tabloidy, pressy magazine. Oh, how gosh. The implication is that he can do better without her. That the people, his business, the global community respects him better without her. If you were to just do this alone, without her and her thing, look how much better you would be. Now, this is a narrative that is weaved across all of the UK media, all of it, conventional, tabloid, normal, not normal, all of it. The idea is, and the message is, Harry, come back to us. We are better for you. Forget her. Now, nowhere there they mention his kids either. You see, it's so inconceivable. It's so dirty for them that the British royal family could have family members with a drop of African blood in them that they are actually praying and hoping to demolish. They're praying and hoping for the demise of a marriage. Can you believe that? I don't know how it's so easy for people to listen to that and accept it and swallow that truth. They are reporters, commentators, TV presenters. If you are coming back to Britain, do yourselves a favor and leave Meghan behind. Harry, we understand he's talking to old friends about how you can possibly make an at least partial return to Great Britain. Forget your friends, Harry. Call your father, the king. Call your brother, the future king. And apologize for the wicked things he said about both their wives. And if you do come back, here's some other advice. Do it under the radar, low profile. Another reason why, best leave your wife behind. I think he'll come home. Yeah. I think he'll come home. And if he comes home, we must be very nice to him because he won't particularly want to. He, he's quite angry, I think, and he's quite, and he, he, to, to me. If he will again, come home alone. Yes, I do. Yes, I do. The king is, as I mentioned before, has left the door wide open for him to do that. And, um, you know, he what am I supposed to assume? That it's because you think she's so horrible? Because I still, I still await for what the accusations really are. I still await, like many a people, for concrete evidence of these accusations that are thrown at this woman every single day, every day, nonstop, every single day. There isn't an hour. Let me make this clear again, and I'll say this out loud. There isn't an hour on that island where there isn't something somewhere being said about Meghan Markle and not in a positive way. Have none of you stopped for a second and question why? Are you so, that's the wrong word I was going to use. Are you so willing to believe the same people that 
attacked Princess Diana. These are the same people. These are the same publications that attacked her over and over, said awful things about her. You are still willing to believe them. Every time they have said something about Harry and Meghan, that now we can say it was not true. It was false. It never happened. But your belief in them still continues. So if a liar is proven to be a liar over and over again, or perhaps it's their sources who are lying, right? Because when Camilla Tomini was presented with the revelation that it wasn't Megan who made Kate cry, it was the opposite. Oh, she was just incensed. No, my sources, my source would never lie to me, but it's not my fault. Like, this is the information I got from my source. You see? So they will never be accountable for what they say. So tell me something. How can you take seriously as evidence, as the truth, someone who cannot and will not stand behind what they say? and say, I put my name on what I'm saying to you. How can you? Please tell me. But you see, it's easier for you to do that than for you to recognize the racism, the biases that you hold so secretly within you. This is Breathe by Becky Hemsley. She sat at the back and they said she was shy. She led from the front and they hated her pride. They asked her advice and then questioned her guidance. They branded her loud and were shocked by her silence. When she shared no ambition, they said it was sad so she told them her dreams, and they said she was mad. They told her they'd listen, then covered their ears, and gave her a hug while they laughed at her fears. And she listened to all of it, thinking she should be the girl they told her to be best as she could. But one day she asked what was best for herself, instead of trying to please everyone else. So she walked to the forest and stood with the trees. She heard the wind whisper and dance with the leaves. She spoke to the willow, the elm, and the pine, and she told them what she'd been told time after time. She told them she felt she was never enough. She was either too little or far, far too much, too loud or too quiet, too fierce or too weak too wise or too foolish, too old or too meek. And she found a small clearing surrounded by firs, and she stopped, and she heard what the trees said to her. And she sat there for hours, not wanting to leave, for the forest said nothing. It just let her breathe. saying you were right went on the princes of the press documentary and i said this but of course even anil rajan was watered down that the, the, the things that i was saying on that documentary were a lot stronger but by this point the palace had put pressure on the bbc can you tell us what you wish wasn't cut out or something that you feel like people are really missing from the story well i think it just is the fact that you know um the prince and princess of wales and 
various members of the royal family present themselves as sort of whiter than white and have this kind of uh, dignified distance from the press, the grubby press corps. And that's simply not true. Their aides are uh, leaking stories all the time. It's exactly what Harry said. He and Meghan didn't stand a chance because the callous were briefing the papers against him. What they do is they have these deals and they say, don't run that story, we'll give you this story. Yep. Narrative in Britain is, oh, they were lightweights, they couldn't cope with it, they want celebrity. Um, I absolutely feel that they tried everything, but they got to the point where it genuinely was impossible for them to get their message out or to have a fair press or a fair representation in the press. And so they left. Megan was so quiet all of a sudden. You see, Megan doesn't have to talk. Number one, she's a mother. Number two, she has a husband who is willing to defend her, even against his own family. They have the sort of love that you guys only dream of, which brings me to sunny point number two. I've noticed a whole lot of women who look just like you, sun-dried tomato face and all, who, who have Meghan Markle's ovaries in your mouth like they taste delicious. Y'all can't keep her name out of your mouth. It's like every time your jaw meat opens, Meghan Markle's name. Could it possibly be that deep down that green with envy jealousy is eating y'all asses alive because Meghan Markle has a prince and you have... And now there is something disturbing that I must bring to the attention of us all. The dangerous implications of recent media signals. One of the most, one of the more chilling, and I'm not, this is not theater. This is not me trying to be hyperbolic or anything like that. But I'll tell you this, a chill went down my spine. I am gonna do my very best to keep my cool. Because I'll tell you, I am not very cool right now. This is one of the most dangerous things. I have seen in a while. And some may think, some may say, well, you're exaggerating, Antonio. This is just an artistic representation of the title of this article. Where's Megan? Why Harry is going it alone. Well, let me say this to you. Why did they not just have Megan in the little feature in the front page of this feature where it's all Harry's? It's sort of like, where is Waldo, right? So why don't they just have Megan, a Megan, right there between all of the Harry's? If they have it, fantastic. I don't see it. But what they chose, someone, someone approved this, someone thought about this. What they chose was to have an image of Megan appear and slowly disappears. This is no accident. This is thought out. Are they suggesting that Megan will be erased? silenced, removed in some symbolic or realistic way. This for me 
is alarming. Because I do not, after everything I've learned, everything I've read, everything I've seen, everything people have said, I have zero trust and confidence in those people. And their intentions are real. Someone okayed this. Someone was okay with a disappearing picture, image of Meghan Markle, the Duchess of Sussex. Now, when Kate went allegedly missing, why did they not do that for Kate? Right? There were, there were many, many, many things that they could have done that could have implied a lot of things for Kate. Did they do it? No. What did they say? They said, leave Kate alone. Leave her alone. Now, I will admit, I was one of the people who was concerned about Kate. Listen, I'm a feminist. I'm not here to like throw anything at Kate or any other woman, period. I will pick the one that best represents my values, the way I see life, and that happens to be Meghan Markle, not Kate Middleton. I have nothing in, in common with Kate Middleton. Not the things I've learned or heard or saw, people have testified and said, makes me not like her that much or want to hang out with her, but that does not mean I wish her ill. I don't know what kind of husband she has. I mean, from, from, from the things that we know, from the things we've read, from what we've seen, it doesn't seem like she has a very kind and loving husband, but others seem to believe that he is and good for them. They're reading from a different book than I am. And that's okay. You hold your opinion. Hold on to it. If, 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 if that's your choosing. But this, this thing here that you've done is not acceptable. It's not amusing. It doesn't amuse me one bit. This, for me, for me, is the representation again of the woman, this woman, Meghan Markle being taken into the town square and lynched again. She appears, she disappears, and everyone just stays mute about it. Where are the people asking the questions? Where are the people saying, this is disturbing? This is not acceptable. Explain yourself. What does that mean? Because you see, it can mean many things. And we've got a lot of crazies out there that can interpret things many a ways. Listen, I'm interpreting it in many a ways. So tell me, what does, what does it mean? What does it mean that there's a Meghan Markle that is disappearing into nowhere? Listen, I understand that a lot of you a lot of you hold resentment towards this woman because you all had this fantasy that somehow you were going to like capture the heart and mind and soul of the rebellious ginger prince. And you were going to make his life. He and he was going to make yours, but it didn't happen. Move on. It didn't happen. He chose someone else. You bitter, bitter people. Come on. Someone sat there. Someone said, let's do it like this. If this is some kind of, I don't know, come back, take back, shade about what happened when Kate was missing. Listen, there were circumstances about what, what, what was happening with Kate. She disappeared. Then there was, oh, she's in hospital. Then we... No one saw her. No one wanted to take her flowers. Nothing happened. Her husband said, I'm going to be by her side forever. Was he? We saw him once go. 
then there was this appearing double in some in 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 in, in some supermarket and then going out for a ride and then a, a picture that was that was, that was so <laughs> Oh, I said I wasn't going to get agitated, and I am agitated. I am. Because this is absolutely troubling to me. Disturbing, to say the least. Disturbing. I have listened to so many of you on your shows, and I'm talking about you, royal correspondents and royal rota and 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 reporters, the ones who've got your your shows here or there, and the things that you say, the things that you say, the things that you imply, the things that you dog whistle out to God knows whom. Not too long ago, the whole thing was, oh, he does want to come back. He wants to come back to the UK. He misses his home. But she, she is the obstacle. She is the obstacle. So what is that implying? What does that imply? She is the obstacle. If there's an obstacle, we get rid of it, don't we? Don't we? I'm asking a question, don't we? We remove the obstacle. So my question then, if she's the obstacle, how, how are we removing the obstacle? You see, the things that you people say and if you think all of us here are stupid, we've been listening, we've been watching, and we're going to call it out. This is not Diana 2.0, my friends. I saw this, and I'll tell you, I am not joking. It's not funny to me at all. A chill went up my spine. I was going to read the article, but when I realized, I, I, I just couldn't even, I, could, I couldn't even read it. I haven't read it. I don't care to read it. When you put an image of a woman and you're implying that she's disappearing, but you use your title of the article, cleverly interplay so that you can justify the imagery. You people are a different kind of sick. A different kind of sick. You know, James O'Brien talked about, and I'm not going to do him any justice, when he talked about the abuse so many of you received, when you went to, 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 to public school, the ones who, who, who were shipped off to school at the age of six or five and the things that happened to you. And it's all internal because no one, no one does therapy there. No one wants to do therapy. For heaven's sakes, you all, so many of you have branded, branded, Harry as a traitor. Why? Why? Let me tell you why. Uh, he, 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 he talked about his family. He talked about his family. He said all those, those things, all those awful things about the queen and about her. Are you freaking kidding me? You see, you are all about your secrets. You like the secrets. But you see, the secrets is what is making you all rot from the inside. Rot. It's the secrets that had, and I'm not going to say his name, do all those things to those children for such a long time. And that Angela person who knew about it didn't say a word, but she has the gall the gall to sit on these shows that invites her and spew her hatred and her 
diarrhea mouth. The nurse tells you uh, that Jimmy Savile comes to visit her hospital and he molests disabled girls, right? Which is sort of what, that's what she told you, is that right? And then you then feed that back to the investigations team or some senior people at the mail. And they go to work attempting to substantiate that. And he's caught. And then maybe even hundreds of victims are prevented from ever being molested. Um, it's not a scenario that ever happened. I don't think I went back and told the investigations. No, but I'm saying if, if you had, if you'd sort of Ooh, blown don't the whistle. Don't blame this on me. No, no, I'm just no. trying to, I'm trying to, in a sense, um, I mean, I think there are lots see of if people. there's more we could have done. You know, we as a society are attempting to learn from what's happened. Yes, I think you mustn't be overwhelmed by someone's fame, and I think nobody is in the same way. You know, he was very, very famous. He had very, very good connections. He... But you all hate him because of the things he said about his family. You know, part of healing out of your trauma is about talking about your trauma exposing your trauma but in, you know it's not until recently that i've realized because i kept i kept thinking why do they if they keep keep saying he did this to his family I, i'm thinking he didn't do anything to his family all he did was tell his truth all he did was write a memoir that isn't so far off from what king charles the third wrote about his mother I don't see any of you taking him to this, to burn him at the stake or something. Listen, if you all can forgive and move on from the adultery that Camilla, who was married and sleeping with a married man, and the king who's married, sleeping with a married woman, and everyone knew about it. So how are we picking our morality right now? How are we picking which virtues are we gonna uplift and which ones are we gonna condemn? So let me see, it's okay to cheat on your wife or your spouse, is it? Why? Because let me see, if we go back in history, Every monarch had, had, had a side piece or two or three side pieces, for heaven's sake. So there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, allegedly, the rumor is that the future king, the heir, had an affair. That is why his brother was so upset with him. And then the other stuff followed. Allegedly, I don't know if it's true. Right? So we are going to pick then that it's okay to cheat, to sleep in another bed and be with another person that is not your spouse. Because if that's okay with all of you, because you've all now elevated Camilla to the status of queen, she's at the same status as the late majesty, Queen Elizabeth II. I never thought that the day would come when Camilla would be at the same stature and status as Queen Elizabeth. And you all will bow and kneel and curtsy to her. But you are condemning Prince Harry, think about that for a minute. Think about it. The woman who, who connived, who did God knows what, made Diana's life impossible and miserable. The woman who then made sure that Diana's Two children are no longer talking. 
there's no harmony between them. Do you think that just happened coincidentally? Do you think that's all Harry's fault? Do you think, oh, it was Megan's fault because she's the black biracial one. And we know those black biracial people. Oh my goodness. Lord have mercy. You see, part of the problem, I think, is that a lot of you are not thinking. A lot of you are lacking the analytical skills to actually sit down and think things through. And the other thing you should do is if you're so certain in your position, question why you are. Also, question where you get your source, your information from. Who is telling you? Because everything all of you think, you didn't just come up with it. None of you did. You see, the Royal Rhoda and those shows, they told you what to think. They've told you everything you think about Meghan Markle, the Duchess of Sussex, is not your opinion. Oh, you, you want to debate it with me? It's not your opinion. It's an opinion that you've acquired. Because you heard Rebecca something said it, Tom something said it, Tim something said it. When are you going to realize? I mean, if you do read, please read Spear. You know, I, I, would, I would hope that a country, a nation that makes itself so proud about its identity, that you would want to know both sides of a story. And you would want to be and do the civil thing. After all, you are the people of decorum and morals and values and properness. So I would suggest, if you haven't, either read Spare or, or listen to it. Watch the Ducky series. And if at the end of all of that, you've read it from his point of view, you've watched the Ducky series, and you still think he's a son of a something, and you still think that she's a son of a, a daughter of a something, you know what? You went into it, you give it a chance, and your opinion is your opinion. You've got it, you hold on to it. And that's okay. But I've listened to so many of you regurgitate, <laughs> vomit this kind of lines. It's the same, it's the same thing. It's like, it's like this disease that has, that has infected the world. Because we have it in every country. We have it in every continent, everywhere. The people who just sit and they watch the same damn channel all the time, and they watch the same people all the time, and they then just repeat what those people told them. And I hate to make this comparison, but, you know, it's, it's, sort, it's sort of like the Trump people, right? No matter what you show them, you tell them, you give them evidence, no. No, no, no. That's a conspiracy. It's a conspiracy. Everything is a conspiracy. Sometimes a goat is just a goat. Sometimes a charlatan is just a charlatan. I am disturbed by that imagery. And this nonsense has got to stop sometime. It's got to stop sometime. And I don't want it to have to stop in any way that brings danger to the Sussexes. Because all of this is a whole bunch of nothing. It's a bunch of nothing. It's a bunch of people who are like 
children. Some of them playing the mean girl character and the, and the jock character, the ones that probably they weren't able to play out in their, in their, in their school days. So they're still stuck in that mentality. But this is all a bunch of nonsense. We've got people dying in wars. We've got people don't know if they're going to wake up tomorrow. We've got generations of people that last month were alive and this month they're not. Whole generations, gone, gone. And you are busy thinking, what else can we put in our magazines and our shows to humiliate, to lynch a woman that has done you nothing? All she's done is she fell in love with the prince you thought you were going to marry or get close to. She came into your most esteemed institution and she respected it. There's things she needed to learn. She did her best to learn them. But there were certain things that she just didn't think were right. And her approach was to try and say, I don't think these things are right. Let's modernize these things at least. But you see the institution, because if you listen to everything she has said and everything Harry has said, they've never gone out and said awful things about the royal family. They said they can improve. They said there's unconscious bias instead of racism, right? And what they've said also, it's the firm, the institution, the people who actually run the business. You see, people think that the queen made every decision. No, the queen didn't make every decision. The decisions that the queen would like to make, and then she goes and, 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 and she tells them, i like to do this. And they're like, no, ma'am, you can't do that. Same with the king. So why this insistence to continue? She saw an institution that is not functioning at its best when it comes to diversity, when it comes to treating people fairly, equally. She saw this enormous platform and influence that the institution has and thought, you know, how, many, how much great stuff we can do to help people, to help the people. And they said, no. And then they proceeded to make her existence impossible. Impossible. And because she had just a shred left of her dignity, she left. And her husband, who understands what she's talking about, left with her. And oh, happy day. Oh, happy day. Because now you see what they can do without you. They don't need it. But your stubbornness and your ego, your, your, your fragile ego, and, and, and that sense that you're rejected, you weren't rejected. No one is rejected if someone doesn't want to change. If we're in a relationship and you don't want to change, you just want to be this moronic person. Then it's not a rejection. It's, it's okay, you stay who you are and I'll go and be who I want to be. So come on. This has got to stop. I, I had planned a, a, a nicer um, ending and, and I. I just don't, I don't have it in me right now. I really don't. 
I am flabbergasted. You know, I, I was watching some one of one of these people again. And she was she was like, Oh, he's so happy. He's so happy without her. You know, she, of course, she's like she's like this and she's the deep in and she's I'm, I'm, and I'm I'm listening to these women. These sad, sad women. Because none of you are happy. Because if you're happy, you would not be saying the things you're saying. A happy, secure woman would never look at another woman and, and, and say the things, imply the things that you all do. But you see, what you don't realize, and maybe you do, men, men watch you and men listen to you. And men see how you treat other women. Men see it. So your unhappiness will continue. Because the men in your life will treat you exactly the same way. Because when you disrespect another woman, it means you dis disrespect yourself. And I'll tell you, most men don't like women like that. They may marry them, but they don't like them. I, I'm, I, I don't know what else to say, to be quite honest. I think I'm going to stop. I'm going to go take a breather and a walk. And perhaps I'll come back and end differently. Or maybe I'll just delete all of this. Not sure. Okay, so I'm back. Oh, I haven't listened to what I, what I said. Um, I will listen to it, and I'll make a decision whether or not to um, stream it. I'm concerned, I think, maybe uh, got to some of the language maybe I used. I'm trying to remember what I said, but... Okay. I, I'm going to try and wrap it all up a little bit. Going from the very top. Tom Sykes' article is, is not an impartial piece of journalism. It is a calculated hit job meant to continue the relentless public harassment of Meghan Markle. By omitting key facts about Jason Knopf, loyalties about Simon Case, manipulations, and the broader machinery of William and Kate. Sykes offers a skewed version of events that serves to protect the image of the future king while scapegoating the woman who dared to stand up to a centuries-old institution. More alarmingly, this latest piece of media manipulation comes at a time when Megan's very existence in the public eye is being questioned. An effort to erase a woman who has done nothing wrong. Nothing but advocate, advocate for herself, her family, and those in need. The press role in, in, in this ongoing campaign of character assassination should not be ignored. And it's time that the public 
and I'll say especially women, can't always leave it to women of color, to black women. I'm saying all women to understand the dangers of such narratives. Call out this abuse for what it is. The truth is clear to me. Megan's story is one of resilience, not retreat. And no matter how many times the Murdoch media tries to erase her, her strength and compassion will remain, lighting the way for others who refuse to be silenced. The narrative that constantly surrounds Prince Harry's visit to the UK. It's whether he will see his father, King Charles III, or his brother, Prince William. Folks, it's exhausting and frankly, very misguided. Every time Harry sets foot in Britain, the media becomes obsessed with whether there will be a family reunion despite the fact that Harry has consistently made efforts to bridge the gap with his family. Time and time again, it has been Charles and William who have refused these overtures. Either by organizing some competing event or allowing the tabloid press to announce with <laughs> grandeur that William will not be seeing his brother. That's fine, William. That's fine. You stay who you are. The hypocrisy is staggering. It's, it's as though the British press, the British media, and their whole royal machinery expect Harry to grovel at their feet, begging for reconciliation that they clearly have no intention of granting. Harry has acted like the adult in this situation, reaching out, offering an olive branch. Oh, of course, you folks have offered 20 million olive, olive branches. And he's, he's made it clear that despite all the personal pain, all of it that he has endured, his wife has endured, he's willing to have open communication with his family. Meanwhile, William and Charles have acted like petulant little children seemingly more interested in winning the public relationship war than repairing the fractured family dynamics. The question that should be asked is not, will Harry see his family? But why do Charles and William continue to avoid him? Meghan and Harry have behaved with dignity and grace in the face of relentless media attacks. They have done nothing to damage the monarchy. I know a bunch of you are probably catching yourselves on fire with that, with that statement. But if you've got a couple of brain cells still left that is functional and not that have been converted into zombie, really go back and listen to what they've done see what they've said, all of that. Really, open heart, open mind. On the contrary, they have been vocal about their love for the family. Their problem was with the institution. The real damage has been caused by the tabloid press, which telegraphs and tell them, how they should think, what they should do. 
every week, every time I see these, 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 <laughs> these so-called purveyors of, of, of what family values are and, and how a monarchy and royals should behave. Oh, well, the king should not do that. He should send a very strong message. Who are you? You know, it's, it's sad that the king does not have a spine. It is sad that the future king is still a child. And the tabloid press will continue to strive on creating division and stirring up drama for the sake of clicks and headlines and money. It's time, I would hope, for the narrative to shift. The problem is not with Harry who has shown maturity, resilience, and a willingness to reconcile. The issue lies with those who continue to ignore him and with the British press, which amplifies and sustains this damaging cycle of rejection and public spectacle. Harry and Meghan have been dignified. Their dignity speaks volumes, while the silence and avoidance from the other side only serves to highlight the immaturity of those who should be leading with compassion and unity. I would hope that the people that need to look in their hearts and really check it carefully but do so sometime soon. Harry and Meghan are good people. They're really good people. And this endless harassment, abuse, no people can take it for this long. Eight years, every single day, eight years. Folks, eight, almost a decade. And there isn't a day where Meghan Markle's name is not dragged through the mud. The things that people have just invented and created. Someone said, I spoke to the friend of this person who said this allegedly. And then a tabloid picks it up and they publish it. And then the other tabloids publish it differently, but they say the same thing. And then all of a sudden it goes into normal vocabulary where now it's not the friend who said it. It's no, she is that. He is that. It's a game. It's a game with people's lives. It's a game that is making a lot of people very rich. And it's a game that has got to end. <sighs> Take care of yourselves. Take care of your loved ones. And for that stranger that is just crossing by your path, be kind. You might be the only kind thing he or she might have witnessed all day, all week. Who knows? Until we speak again, my friends. Thank you. Take care.